Hi, I'm Jay Richards with the Discovery Institute. We are here in Bellevue, Washington at the COSM 2022 conference. Uh, and we've just concluded a really good engaging panel called AI Friend or Foe uh, with uh, AI researcher, former uh, engineer at Google, Blake Lemoyne, Robert Bob Marks, who is at the University of Baylor. He's also here as the director at Discovery Institute of the Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence. And George Bentania is also on the panel from Harvey Mudd College that's done this research. And there was a lot of the kind of central issues having to do with AI that uh, emerged in that. And I'm here with Bob Marks to talk a little more about it. Bob, thanks for joining me. Jay, it's always always a pleasure. So, so what was the sort of gist? It was supposedly AI friend or foe, but the panel ended up talking less about that until the end and more about the nature of AI and this experience that Blake Lemoyne had yes. um, actually with this uh, this Lambda system, actually Google, which sort of, is sort of a tragic story, but really this this question, well, you, you describe it in your own words, how, what you think the panel was about. Well, first of all, I kind of disagree with the title of the panel. Yeah. It was friend or foe, I don't think, uh, I don't think AI is a friend or a foe, it's a tool, right. and it's what you use the tool for. You mm -hmm. can use a tool for good or bad, and that's when it becomes a, fr a friend or a, a foe, if yeah. you will. Yeah, but the panel is uh, the capability of uh, artificial intelligence to achieve a level of performance of a human being. Mm. And um, the idea is that, uh, well, the question is, whether artificial intelligence can become sentient, mm -hmm. whether it has consciousness, right. whether it understands, and a number of other things. My my view, and mm -hmm. the purpose, I'll plug my book. Non yeah, please non, do. Non-computable you, yeah. avail on, available on Amazon.com. <laughs> That's terrific. Like everything else, <laughs> uh, non-computable you. And um, so my, my viewpoint mm -hmm. is that there are certain attributes of computers that are not computable. Okay. Alan Turing showed back in the 1930s, he proved it mathematically mm -hmm. that there were certain things the computers simply could not do. Okay. And so there are problems that are non-computable, and since then we've discovered a whole slew of problems that are not computable. Mm -hmm. So this, this brings to question of whether humans have attributes which are right. non-computable. And if they're non-computable, that has big implications for artificial intelligence because right. artificial intelligence is restricted to be computable. Things that are computable is what you do. So, the, so the key, kind of key sort of metaphysical question would be: Yeah, are humans merely computers, complex computers, or are we more than that? Yeah, are we? Yeah. Are we? Um, Computers made out of meat. Yes. I think is, is yeah, that's the the term of art. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. and uh, yeah, the answer is no. And I think that there's some obvious ones. Um, I think that for love, compassion, you know, the emotions that mm -hmm. we feel are non-computable. I think that those are obvious. I think that um, I think that uh, there are some less obvious attributes that would include creativity, understanding, right. and sentience. Yes. Uh, now all of these are being used and bandered around mm -hmm. without being really defined. No. I mean, so, so one has to define these things. That's the, that's the difficulty, even, and you both all admitted on the panel, the whole AI discussion, first of all, artificial intelligence is an amazing marketing term for statistical and algorithm. It, and <laughs> AI is it's astonishing in what it's doing. No, so I know. I don't want to downplay No, that. exactly, it's an amazing yeah. technology, but even when we talk about, well, this system understands this, or we teach it, or it learns, or of course anthropomorphizing, anthropomorphizing That'd be fine, except that there really is this question, and, and Blake Lemoyne is a perfect example of this. He was persuaded that Google did what uh, Page and Brin actually always wanted to do, which is to create an artificial general intelligence that was sentient and uh, even had emotions, right? And so yeah. he's persuaded by this. And so he, he said, well, it, it passed the Turing test. So what, what's the Turing test, and what is he talking uh, the about? The Turing test is 70 years old, and it was proposed by Alan Turing, the mm -hmm. same guy same that, guy. Computed, same guy that yeah. did the non-computable. And uh, Turing was interesting um, in a number of different ways. He was, he was an atheist, number one. Mm -hmm. He would have liked to shown the computers could duplicate yeah. human beings. Anyway, he proposed the Turing test, and here, here, here's the basic idea. You, you sit with the computer behind a curtain, and there's somebody else that you're testing on the other side of the curtain, and you talk to each other, and uh, in Turing's days, it's before that we had keyboards, but mm -hmm. imagine you type a, type a question in, and there's a response from the other side, you right. have a conversation. So the Turing test is passed if 
uh, you as the non-test sub, well, it's the test subject, yes. can figure out whether or not that is a human being which is talking to you. Okay. If, if the computer acts in a way that you think, yeah, that's a human being, then you've passed the Turing test. Okay. Yeah, and so the question is, um, because really what's the, the, what it's testing is if a computer could mimic a person enough to fool someone on some other person, yes. but that's appearing to be Conscient, conscious is different from being conscious, it obviously. Is. So mimicking, yeah. and yeah, that's the, that, that, that's the point I wanted to get to exactly, is that mimicking is very different from duplicating. Yes. And so that the duplication, the duplication is mm -hmm. something which is not algorithmic, not computable. Yeah. Well, and it's, it seems to me that the Turing test ends up being a very low bar because I, oh, it's I mean, incredibly low I mean, I would guess that someone from the 1950s that sat down you know, on a Google a Google page asking it questions uh, would almost certainly think there's somebody behind it, right? Well, yes, of course, we know that's not true. And today we, we have uh, chat bots like GPT-3 and uh, uh, Lambda, which mm -hmm. is what Blake yeah, looked Lambda. at. Yeah, Lambda, yeah. And uh, these are incredible, and I think that there's yeah. no doubt in a conversational mode that they would pass the Turing test. Yes, and so I, so that's if that's a low bar, what would be a relevant, uh, like a higher bar, a relevant test for this? Well, uh, the Turing test is kind of looking and judging a book by its cover. Okay. You're, you're only judging right. the output. Yes. Uh, uh, it's better to get inside. And the, the following test called the Lovelace test was proposed by Summer Bringsjor at Rensselaer. Mm -hmm. Lovelace was the first computer programmer in the um, 19th century. Hmm. And uh, she, she uh, is, there's a programming language named after her. But the Lovelace test is, uh, is the following. Mm -hmm. A computer is going to be creative and it measures creativity like the Turing test, is, yeah. I guess, in some way, that you have demonstrated creativity if the output of the computer program is beyond the intent or the explanation of the programmer. Hmm. Okay. And so that's never happened. No. You, you, the computer does what you tell it to, or if yes. you make a mistake, it does something else, <laughs> but you still are able to go in and you're able to diagnose why it did what it did. Okay. So something that's just discontinuous, because you could, of course, in a sense, train an algorithm to do something and you expect it to do that, but if you train, I don't know, uh, um, image recognition software or something yeah. like that, and then somehow it started composing music or something right, like that, exactly. right? This would be something that, I mean, at least for me, that would pass the Lovelace test. I think there's something going on here, right. you know. Um, I, would, I would honestly probably initially assume that somebody was playing a trick on me, but still, I would think, oh, absolutely. okay. And, yeah. and again, the Lovelace test has never been passed by yeah. any computer software or AI of which I'm aware. Well, and that would be, I mean, because again, we're right at the edge of the question, okay, what is agency? What does it mean to be an agent conscious? sentient, what does it mean to be creative, but also how do we tell if someone else is an agent? Because, of course, in our own case, we don't ever have to deal with other agents except for human agents, except right. with respect to maybe angels or God, and most of us aren't usually directly interacting with them. Right, exactly. And so we are humans, right? We have direct access to our own by introspection, our own agency, and then right. when we interact. So, so even though we're reading external signals, we're dealing with other humans that we can reasonably think are like us. So insofar as we're conscious, they are too. Um, it's different though, I would think. I'd think you'd need a higher bar when it comes to these technologies that we've made, for which we have no reason, I think, uh, other than metaphysical reasons, to think that they're going to be conscious. I mean, I, it, ultimately, there's no reason to assume a computer is con becoming conscious than to think, I know, that a tractor well, is, is or something. Well, this is because, <laughs> you know, we use the term consciousness, but we really don't define it. Do no, we, we don't. Uh, currently, there's, there's four models that I know of of consciousness, mm -hmm. and none of them have got any traction yeah. that, that I'm aware of. But we do know characteristics of consciousness, uh, sentience. But even sentience is hard to get your hand around. It is. It is. But they're characteristic of sentience. Yes. It's characteristic of sentience. Um, for example, qualia. Which right. Is, exactly. Which, which is experiential. That's uh, right. Okay, experiential like for, first person experience or Brentano's aboutness. That thoughts are about things. My thought of about. An ice cream cone is different from the ice cream cone, which yes. doesn't have an aboutness. So there yes. are these sort of properties of thought and consciousness. At least you sort of do, you were just sort of analyzing it. And so, that, but then that does allow us to say, okay, look, is a computer having thoughts about something? Does a computer have first-person perspective? Um, th th that's a cogent question. But once you really ask it that way, what reason would there be to think that it would? I don't think that my car does. It would only be that well, we've programmed it to do things that 
mimic aspects of intelligence. Well, it, and it is, it, it is a mimicking. Let's get back to your idea of eating ice cream. Yeah. If I eat ice cream, I put it to my mouth, I feel the coldness, I feel the sweetness of the mm -hmm. ice cream, feel it melt to my tongue and swallow it and things yes. of that sort. Now, you and I can talk about this because we've both experienced the Gloria, right? <laughs> right, yes. But uh, how would you explain or duplicate that experience in a person that has been void of the sense of smell and taste since birth? Yeah. You couldn't. You can say, Very you hard. Can say it's cold. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. he would understand that it was cold. But attempting to explain to him the sweetness and these other, these other attributes, yeah. you could give him chemical formulas, you can give him... You know, the, the changes of phase in the ice cream <laughs> right. from, from a solid to a liquid. So you can explain all that stuff, but that, that, uh, that comes far from actually duplicating that experience. Yes. So the point is, is that if you can't explain that to another person, how are you going to program a computer to right. experience it, to duplicate it? Exactly. Uh, it can mimic it. It can yep. say, yeah, that's delicious ice cream because mm -hmm. you can have artificial tongues and yeah, things sure. of that sort. And uh, it could, but the, the duplication of the experience is not possible. What, what was fascinating about this panel, I think, is having Blake Lemoyne, who has had this experience with this Google yes. software, which we talked when I interviewed him, that he said, actually, these were, because I was wondering, okay, what, what's under uh, the Lambda? He said, actually, what they did is they layered a bunch of other algorithms they that did. Had come from the Kurzweil lab, Ray Kurzweil's lab at, at Google, that were designed to pass the Turing test. So we're not dealing with, you know, things that run, they're literally a bunch of different ways of designing it. So it's, in some ways it's not surprising it would pass the Turing I test. I forget what the Lambda acronym is, but the, the last, the D in it stands mm -hmm. for dialogue. Okay. Which is the point, which the point is, is that it was trained for dialogue. Yes. One of the things they did different in the Lambda uh, software that they didn't do in other uh, generative text generators, mm -hmm. is that they actually trained it on human conversation. Right. They went out to crowd workers and they, they told these crowd workers to have conversations that were meaningful, that were understanding, that were patient, mm -hmm. and uh, then they did word capture on that and they used that to train the neural network and there was like over 1.1 trillion tokens mm. and wow. a token is, a, <laughs> is the amount of data that's, that's used to train it. And so what did it do? It did exactly what it was trained to do. <laughs> yeah. It was it was trained to pass the Turing test. It did, but it had no 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 sentience, no understanding. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, from your book, yeah. like I read about Searle's Chinese yes. room, okay, that was, right. that was in the human advantage, uh, your book. And I think that that's probably the best explanation for why AI has no understanding. Exactly. The, the, the computer, it works at the level of symbols and syntax, but not at the level of meaning or, or semantics, as yes, Curl says exactly. it. And that's so it doesn't know what's going on in the sense that we do. Well, I could talk about this honestly all day because okay. it's one of my favorite topics, yeah. and we're supposed to keep these short. So okay. it's really good. Thanks so much for the panel. Thanks so much for joining me. Okay, Jake. Excellent. Bob Marks, and thank you for joining us here at the COSM 2022 Conference.